continue the theme of um, Claren and Libraries, we've now got a, a panel session uh, entitled Claren and Libraries, Infrastructures Working Together. Um, and the, the idea behind this is that while um, new infrastructures for the arts and humanities and social sciences like uh, Claren and Daria have emerged relatively recently, um, libraries have for, for many centuries been the most important resource for researchers and as we've seen from what Peter had to say re remains so today. So for this reason um, earlier this year we held a workshop on the theme of Claren and Libraries um, at the KB, the National Library of the Netherlands um, in May this year uh, and this panel session is going to feature some of the uh, participants from that workshop and we want to move on from the discussion there, the initial discussion, which brought together uh, representatives of the, the, the two communities or the two infrastructures. Um, and we want to move on to discuss what the next steps should be in, in our collaborations. Um, so we've got three panelists who are going to give short opening statements. I'll ask them to come up one at a time uh, here. And they've got, um, I'll try and keep them on a, on a tight leash. And they have, uh, um, a maximum of five minutes. I've limited them to three slides each. Uh, so these will be short opening statements on what the next steps uh, should be for Clarin and libraries. Um, I'll just briefly introduce the th uh, who the three of them are. Um, we've got Sally Chambers, uh, who you've just seen uh, kind of starting the panel session nice and nice and early. Um, Sally's from the Ghent Centre for Digital Humanities and the Royal Library of Belgium and she's a director of the Daria Research Infrastructure. Uh, we have Andrea Savit from the Leibniz Institute for Deutsche Sprache and national coordinator of Clarin in Germany. And of course, Peter Leinen from the German National Library. So first of all, um, Sally. Thanks, thanks very much, Martin. And uh, it's great to be here. And it's really great to see that libraries playing a central role in research infrastructures. There we go. So, um, Clarin and libraries, what are the next steps? So we were allowed to say three things. So the first thing I would like to present um, was the idea, and this is a Daria White paper that um, we wrote now almost two years ago, thinking about cultural heritage data as humanities research data. One of my favorite quotes from this paper is something like, can we do digital humanities research without cultural heritage institutions, including libraries? Um, I would like to think that we can't. And in this paper, we sort of explored what is the role of um, cultural heritage institutions in um, the humanities research data infrastructure. And I think there are a number of initiatives that may be familiar to many of the participants uh, of the Clarin Conference. So the European Open Science Cloud, and the social sciences and humanities uh, variant of that shock, and in particular, the SSH open marketplace. And I think there'll be a session later today on this. And then another um, flagship initiative that is re recently starting to kick off, the European data space for cultural heritage. With thinking about cultural heritage data within the context of uh, research infrastructures and research data management, Peter already referred to that in his presentation. What is the role of cultural heritage data and the specific role of libraries? Secondly, uh, and, and Peter already referred to this in his presentation, if we're thinking of libraries and all kinds of libraries as collection holding institutions, how can we think differently about the way we provide access to both digitized and um, born digital collections and all the metadata describing them? Some of you may be aware of the Collections as Data initiative, which was kicked off in the United States, but is increasingly gaining traction in Europe. 
This is where we think uh, differently about the provision. It's in some ways turning the digital library inside out. So we provide the underlying files and make them available for easy, um, more easily um, analysis by using digital methods. And um, Coonrad's uh, question was very much like that. Can I? Can I analyze all of the, the um, newspaper, digitized newspaper of the German National Library using my Clarin tools? It's exactly this kind of thing we want to do. Here you can see one of the Data KBR, which is an initiative that we're looking at in Belgium. And I would very much like to see, um, well, I already think of the Clarin resource families as a way of providing collections as data. And together with Daria, we've already started thinking about how um, uh, Daria and Clarin could work together on these kind of collections as data at a European level. And finally, once we've got this mass of what Peter said, unstructured data, um, how can we start making it usable and useful for um, uh, humanities researchers? So how can we move from collections to corpora? Here I've, um, on the screen, you may be able to see two very interesting research papers. The one, uh, first one comes from the NewsEye project and the several, the, there are some of the authors in here and looking at interdisciplinary re, re workflows for, for example, for um, analyzing digitized historical newspapers. So um, here we're looking at not only technical issues, but cultural and social issues. How can we bring together computer scientists, humanities scholars and librarians and together build infrastructure that would work for all? And I always like to stand up in a Clarin conference when we're thinking about there's many uh, computational linguists in the room. What do we mean by corpora? And I think that could be very different for different researchers, even in the humanities. And um, Barbara McGillivray and her colleagues wrote a very interesting paper on trying to understand what are the differences between digital humanities corpora and computational linguistic corpora. Maybe when we're thinking of corpora in the Clarin and Daria context, maybe we need to explore some ideas around there. Thanks very much. I would like to bring a different perspective, um, namely, and how far uh, research infrastructures uh, and uh, content providers like libraries can work together. And I would like to start with the idea that content is somehow king. Companies invest large sums, in a way billion of euros, but to be more precise, may in most cases billions of dollars to create content by harvesting the web, by offering somehow free services like email, like storage, like office tools. And the public sector cannot compete with these large companies what the investment of money uh, concerns and also with the size of the resources they developed. Uh, of course, we do, have, we do not have uh, the financial means, uh, but there's also stated a bit euphemistically, uh, we do have different interpretations of the legal, not to mention the ethical frame we are living in. So we do not do some things what large companies do. <clears throat> but we have something to offer. We have the Clarion infrastructure and we do have the libraries. The Clarion has the technical infrastructure and a knowledge infrastructure for providing access to language data. Clarin is collaborating within Europeana. It's uh, collaborating uh, with many infrastructures in uh, in the in the in the in the countries. And uh, at the workshop mentioned earlier by Martin, uh, we found some ways to to deal with these. Yeah, and where benefit we can achieve. The libraries host tons, and we have seen it in, in, uh, in Peter's presentation, also literally speaking tons, uh, but also um, um, 
large amounts of digital data, uh, high quality data, so uh, multilingual content, uh, each of the national libraries in Europe, um, most of the national libraries on, in Europe focus on different languages, namely their, their languages of the countries. Their mission, their mission is to keep it for the next generations, essentially forever, but is this all? I don't think so. Uh, we could make more out of this data, of this content, so we can, in a way, deliver this treasure to the modern day customer. <laughs> the promise, but also the challenge, of course, is we have to try to bring together this high quality content. This is a difference to all the uh, content on the web that is uh, grabbed and that is uh, collected. So we only have high quality content from our libraries and the technology provided uh, in the infrastructure, in the infrastructure consortium, consortium um, funded by public, by public uh, funding money. So thank you. So it's me again. Um, <laughs> Looking, looking back on this workshop mentioned uh, twice, uh, it was also very interesting for me to see there's a variety of initiatives and ideas, tools and projects also in the, in the community of the national libraries or in the library system at all. Even from my feeling, the knowledge about these initiatives is also already valuable. But let me say, Library is not library, so we have different types of libraries, so not one size fits all. Um, and again, if you think on the function national library in Germany, this might be different than the organization national library, because we are a very young organization and have only a limited collection uh, in, in the time, so to speak. Um, Collection is libraries, collection of libraries. I told you already they are unstructured in each and every dimension you might imagine. They are big. And the using of these collections might not be that, that easy without any projects, without any support. So the first need is we need a research-driven structuring and indexing, including this derived text formats, or maybe also including a more computationally feasible infrastructure. And that's what's, what I learned on within one of the projects we have, we have to cross-linking our collection to other collections. On the level of metadata, we do it already, but we have a discussion in the morning, not, not put an unstructured building with the next unstructured building. This will end up in mess, but not in, in something useful. So this to think structuring, this is what, what you are to tell us, what is the, the way from collection to corpora? It's a, it's a story behind and we have some legal and some ethical restrictions um, where I get the feeling that we have to attack that on a European level and not only on a national state level. So this, this might be also the, some hint where we should locate some, some of these initiatives. We have a contact after, right after the workshop um, with the European, with the conference of the European National Librarians, be careful. Um, this is a network of 46 national libraries in 45 European countries. And this is the next homework for you. You might, might get into this detail, <laughs> but come back to serious. We get a go for a dialogue forum with Clarin and Daria EU, with in principle, all the national libraries we have in, in Europe or in the EU, EU. So this in principle with this 46 national libraries. So this is one very concrete step we would should go in the, in, the next, in the next months. But there are some other activities I would like to mention. There's the International Federation of Library Associations and Institutions, short IFLA. There's a 
community or a, yes, a community of the re European, of Europe's research library community. And there's also a consortium of European research libraries. This might be also some levels we might incorporate into the idea of, of this dialogue forum with Clarin and Daria EU together with the national libraries in Germany. I guess that's it. Thanks. Okay, thank you very much to thank you very much to uh, all three of you. Um, we've got some time for discussion now. Um, I'm very keen for the the panelists to continue talking to each other and asking each other questions. Uh, but there is also the uh, the opportunity uh, to take questions from the floor. Um, so please think about any questions that you have and raise your hand uh, clearly. If you um, I've got a very bright light shining in my eyes, so raise your hand very very clearly if you do have a question. Um, I'd like to kick things off though with a question that uh, that I have because we I think one of the most interesting things that's been said is talking about collections as data. Um, I think it's a notion that Sally certainly talked about and we should think about what are the next steps to to make that a, a, a real possibility? How do we enable distant reading with um, library collections? So there are questions about availability that we've already discussed. Uh, common text formats, uh, but also I think, you know, to enable effective searching, particularly of historical text, there's layers of annotation, of normalization, lemmatization, named entity recognition, perhaps, that could be applied to them. Um, so I'd be interested to know what the panelists think about the possibilities for kind of bundling together, you know, turning some of their uh, collections of uh, into, um, you yeah, know, kind of in, into data that can be used for that sort of um, uh, large-scale cross-searching, data mining, and distant reading. Yeah, um, yes, thanks for, for this question. Well, I think this is um, a difficult question for two reasons, because we uh, do have the problem that we cannot offer a derived text format, uh, or we, we only can offer derived text formats uh, once. We have to make sure that we do not offer too many derived text formats because this bears the risk that the text can be regenerated based on these derived text formats. But the most important question uh, I have is what is needed? So what do, the, for instance, the computational linguists need? Do we need a bag of words uh, uh, without the stop words? Do they need uh, the full text? Well, they can't get the full text, but what is the format they can make use of? Uh, and there is no standardized approach for um, uh, for these uh, requirements. So if you, if you read these, uh, uh, these proceedings from ACL calling and so on, you see lots of data manipulating, pre-processing tasks, and then people use some formats, but there is no agreement on, uh, on, the, on the format. Maybe somehow Cornell, but it's 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 re it's really difficult. So we need both. Uh, we need we can offer something, but we need also a specification of the requirements. I think. Yes, to be come have a look at the at the fair principles. So I I would it was the first the first uh, letter stands for findable. So the first step is to my experience, to my opinion. Um, make those things findable, independent where they are located. So it's, this is more a question on, on metadata, but might also be a, a question on full text search. We have the idea on, on this federated content search, but this requires, again, speaking for the national libraries, that we have structured full text available and not this formats we have. So this is, this is make it findable. Make it interoperable is more or less the same thing. Uh, have a full text format, which is more or less compatible with, with all the other ones around. So standardization of that is, is also a question. Accessible is what Andreas already told, might be a little bit difficult, especially for those uh, collections or for those objects uh, where the, the copyright law 
uh, tells us something. Um, and the reusable is also a question on, on both. This is the most complicated topic, I guess, on this with this uh, FAIR principles. But findable should be the first one we should attack. And this might also be a very valid option for, for this CNL uh, working group. How get, we, how get we findable all the data? If you remember on, on the project I mentioned on, on children and youth literature, we collect, collect a lot of data, of metadata, cataloging data from the national libraries in Europe, in South America, and, and what you ever might imagine, because there are no standardized way to get them. We bring the National Library also in, an, in another rule in, in the context of, of those projects to be a service provider for those data um, and have some, if necessary, we have some contracts also with OCLC as a big, big uh, infrastructure provider for libraries that we might have also the data from OCLC. But again, make it findable, make it accessible, is, is the, the first topic we should uh, attack uh, also with these huge collections, but need some steps to do to make structured uh, on, on the different level, for my opinion. There's no way out to have a structured collection, otherwise you are lost in space. I'd like to go back to one of the Peter's slides earlier about these 120% projects. I think librarians are very good at being perfectionists and not daring to start. So with the Glam Lab, so some of you may know there's an international Glam Labs community that was initiated by um, the British Library and has got um, labs or libraries and other <clears throat> cultural heritage institutions that are interested in working with collections as data. So um, we've, we've got a webinar on the 25th of October and we're going to try and have a really pragmatic checklist to help, as, as Peter said, not everybody, not libraries, every library, not everybody is a German National Library or the British Library or the BNF. We need to help all libraries to be able to do this. So if we can have a pragmatic checklist of how we can put collections into data, as data into practice and start addressing things like data formats and make, making this happen in real life. Yeah, we've got a question over here, Daria. Daria Fischer, Clara in Slovenia. Thanks for a very nice uh, keynote talk and a uh, very interesting panel. I have a question for um, you with experience from the library world. Um, and it is um, as follows. Um, what is uh, your experience? What are you already doing or what we should be doing together to make sure that uh, your collections as uh, research data are future proof. On the one hand, you don't want to do digitization, pre-processing, enrichment only once because then 10, 20 years from now, uh, your results won't be useful for the researcher community. But you also don't want to repeat all these steps too many times because you have an unmanageable amount of data. So how do you make your research data future proof? Thanks. Hopefully I get the question right. <clears throat> Um, the first is to, to have them structured in, in, in a common sense. Um, this is the first step. On the other hand, if we came around with this digitized stuff, I get, I get the feeling that we have to do OCR each and every two years on, on that. So there's no way out. If we, if we are looking on, on getting better and better on these data, there, there has to be done because the algorithms get better and better. I didn't expect that there will be a, a hundred percent OCR at some, some, some day. The other question is, um, if you're looking at the, at the figures, at the numbers we have in the, in the German National Library, there will be no way to do some very sophisticated algorithm on the complete collection. So if you're looking on the dime novels, it might be a valid size of a, of a sub-collection of, um, of, a, of a data pool. 
where we can additional do something. But as I told you, we are then we are part of the, of the research process and we have to be care of the repeatability of the research process. And we have, maybe we have to add another layer on it. So there's no, for my opinion, there's no way out to, to store all the data we, we get into one project and all the derived text format at a timestamp X or Y. So this is a, it's not the amount of data. It's the complexity behind to manage it. This is uh, the fear I have. So it's not, not storage about data. If you are looking on this number, there's not, there's not, not much than, than one petabyte behind it. So this is not the amount of data to be, to be the problem, but the complexity on all these levels, because you have to store all that uh, additions, all these annotations, you have to store it uh, for the eternity. I think this is a, an incredibly interesting question. And I like to think of digitization is a bit like milk. It has a shelf life and there is a lot of legacy digitization. And I think that it, the problem is that we can't necessarily at this stage re-digitize everything or re-OCR things um, very, very frequently. So I'm wondering whether um, if we have research led processes. So we've got massive um, collections of various different types of data. If we can A, work together with the researchers to see which data they want and improve at the level of subcorpora, um, certain parts of the of the mass of the digitization and work to with things like the GPUs and that Kunrad was mentioning earlier to try and improve that and uh, keep this 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 sort of that's a bit of a strange metaphor but keep the the digital library alive and fresh because uh, yeah I think there's a lot of legacy digitization that uh, will not be fit for purpose anymore. Um, are, there any, are there any more questions from the from the floor before I uh, do keep thinking about it? And I'll, I'll keep looking if someone has a, a sudden um, a sudden a question suddenly comes to you. But um, that's fine. Yeah, uh, yeah, Mark. Yes, uh, uh, it's Martin Matisen from CSC in Finland, and I'm um, um, wanted to go to uh, Peter's statement about uh, keeping data for the eternity um, and Sally's statement that some data is just uh, not fit for purpose anymore. So, so what are your thoughts on deleting data? On, on, and, and with deleting data, I don't mean only the data, I also mean the metadata, say the annotation from 20 years ago or the OCR information from 20 years ago. So the, the, easy, the easy answer answer on that question is we have no annotation on that data and we have no OCR. But the serious the serious question is we have to store it as it get into our catalog. This is this is our DNA, uh, so to speak. But might be also development in in this because the long time preservation is sometimes sometimes 10 years but sometimes 500 years um, but i guess at the moment where it enters a research project there's not a question on deleting mm -hmm. yes i totally agree uh, but i think the the issue you raise is also a bit more general. So if we, in a large scale, annotate our corpora and we produce data and data, we have to uh, be aware that storage is not for free. It does have some consequences, not only monetarily, but also ecologically. And in some cases, um, we have to think a little bit stronger in the direction on what is the data that cannot be reproduced and what is the data uh, that is um, yeah that would be lost and would, would lead to a kind of a loss of, um, uh, of of somehow cultural heritage and 
I guess that most of the data annotated in uh, in machine processes can be more easily be reproduced uh, by rerunning whenever necessary a certain annotation frame. But of course, sustainability of soft software is another issue. And therefore, it is really a tough question, yes. But we should not ignore this. So this is a, it comes with a price. So the, the, uh, even if it's it's only a petabyte, uh, yeah, it's, it, it, it's getting more. And uh, we have to deal with this, uh, with this data. Thank, thank you. It's an, it's an incredibly difficult question. And I think... Um, if we think of cultural heritage, archivists are a lot better than deleting things than librarians. Um, they have retention policies and they they have deleting stuff built into their uh, uh, intellectual fabric, let's say. I think there's two things. One, um, I don't know if I speak for many national libraries, but in Belgium, um, any anything that comes into the collections of a national library comes to become part of the Belgian state. And I think there is the sort of legal deposit that you're not actually allowed to delete things. Whether because of the digital data and this has really serious implications, whether the law will need to be changed because um, uh, related to that kind of thing about, about deletion. Um, and I think we need to think about digital preservation, what things do we really need to preserve for perpetuity? What things do we need to refresh? I mean, do we need, I mean, thinking about digital archaeology, do we need to see what the OCR looked like in the 1990s to be able to think of the historical context? So, yeah, very tough question, but uh, very important to think about. Thank you. And if you want to keep the mic, Sally, because we've got a question from um, one of the remote uh, participants from Torsten Trippel, who um, picks up on the point that you, you distinguish corpora for computational linguists and for digital humanities. And could you elaborate on what you think those differences might be? Because many computational linguists would see themselves as part of the digital humanities and may use the same data and tools in their research as other scholars from the humanities. So do you think this is a, a, a real difference? Of course I was. Thank you very much for that question, uh, Torsten. Um, of course, I was being a bit pr provocative, um, partially for two reasons. One, I think um, if you ever say corpora in a, a big room, it, it, uh, many people understand things differently. And I think we need to understand, uh, get a shared understanding of things. But just to give a specific example, I remember we were at a conference in the Netherlands and we were talking about digitized historical newspapers. And there was a corpus where there had been parts of speech tagging, named entity recognition, et cetera, et cetera. But there were no images um, because um, this was looking at text. And people who were looking at from a humanities perspective, maybe on typographical layout, um, really interested in the images, part of digitized newspapers, for example, so I think this, this is why if we understand what the needs are from corpus, so even if you look at digitized newspapers, I think you can look at it from different perspectives. And I would like to see that um, we have underlying base data that we can um, extract in various ways um, based on standards for the needs of the particular researchers. So maybe we have one or two ways we can get that data out of, um, make it into collections as data, um, but to meet different needs. So I, I was being a bit provocative, but uh, um, I think we need to understand what the needs are. Um. Thanks. Uh, thank you. Um, we're moving towards the end of the, uh, the, the session now. There's just one thing I wanted to, to, to make sure I mention in terms of next steps for particularly for people from Clarion. And that, that's that at the workshop, we did identify that there, there were lots of um, collaborations already existing and already going on. There are quite a few national libraries and uh, research, other research libraries already involved in Clarion um, consortiums and Clarion collaborations and projects. So there's quite, there's already quite, quite a lot going on. And we set up a, an email list, uh, Clarion and Libraries, uh, which I'd encourage any of you who are in, interested in this topic to join. 
because uh, there will be get ongoing activities. As, as you've seen, there are quite a lot of different forums that we need to be part of in order to reach you know, national libraries, university libraries, uh, and other communities. Um, so uh, please do um, stay in touch. And an easy way to, to do that would be to sign up for the clarinet and libraries uh, mailing list. If you don't know how to do that, email me or uh, the central clarin contact points and we can help you with that. Um, so this will be a this will be an ongoing ongoing collaboration. Um, we've got a few minutes left, and I wanted to uh, allow the the panelists to make a, a, a final statement if they if they have any, perhaps to identify one uh, one key point about what we can uh, what we can do next. What are you going to be inspired to leave this room and, and do to further collaboration between uh, Clarin and libraries? Uh, perhaps Peter, we'll start with you. I have spoken so much, I, I, I would say I give the word to Sally. Um, I found, again, I found that it a very exciting way we are going and, and um, would, be, would be nice to, to have more national libraries also for me to get into contact with, with uh, more national libraries also in working in the, in the context of, of Daria or Clarine or whatever. Yes, um, just for um, some, some history, when we started uh, planning this workshop that actually took place uh, in spring this year, uh, uh, Martin and I started this uh, uh, base before, the, no, some months before the pandemic uh, stopped all of our activities. Uh, then we had a kind of a halt and then uh, we started this again. But this means that we are still very in the beginning and I see lots of potential in this field and I would like to see uh, maybe in the next conferences, papers dealing with these things and um, that this actually, um, yeah, that this activity flies, uh, not only from the libraries uh, part where there are already some activities with the CNL and uh, infrastructures, but also from the infrastructures like like ours, like Clarin. Thank you. Um, we had a very uh, interesting conversation at lunch um, um, about, for example, the Clarin uh, collection registry. Um, we've got the Clarin resource families. And uh, if we could work together with Daria, other infrastructures, the national libraries, to see what we need to do together at the European level. Um, Peter mentioned things like the legal aspects. I mean, at the moment, it is very difficult to put national library data, for example, on high performance computing centers to be able to process this data particularly at a transnational level. So if we wanted to look at data from, for example, Germany, Belgium, and um, the UK, for example, that is very difficult to do. So I think we really need to work together and see where we can put the efforts uh, together to make this happen. Okay, thank you very much. And we'll conclude the panel session now. Thank you.